this debt, this destruction. Global news impacts us. We have to change the way we live. This is why we need independent media. Cheers and salutations. Welcome, everyone, to this uh, very special interview here at Hard Lens Media. We like to give a voice to the voiceless, and there's been somebody who's been speaking truth to power and calling out the establishment, and his name is Jose Vega. He's been on our show numerous times, and recently, I think we are all well aware of the devastating conflict that's taking place between Israel and Palestine. Thousands of lives forever impacted, thousands of lives forever lost. And it seems like we are on this trajectory for ongoing forever war. And nonetheless, we have a corporate media and pundits who like to promote it, to have access to politicians who are intertwined with war profiteering and the military industrial complex and all the other lobby and corporate groups that are associated with it. Now, with corporate media, we have people who don't tell the truth, who purposely lie. Or either that read notes so that we could keep on drinking the neoliberal sauce and not challenge our system. So before I bring on our guest, I just want to point out that our guest, Jose Vega, has confronted politicians across the political spectrum. And this right here is very important because we also have to call out our corporate media because corporate media is intertwined, as I said before, with having access to these politicians and not challenging them. And Rachel Maddow. Well, one person who profited off the lie that is Russiagate, because let's face it, the reason why we are intertwined with ongoing war with Russia or either that having such a maddening need for forever war is because of people like Rachel Maddow who don't tell the news, but more or less read to you and tell you what to think and what to feel and not have you think critically. And she recently came out with a book about how to fight fascism here in America titled, uh, prequel well no one tell her about uh the big industrial groups and corporate interests that were very well connected to the third reich in the 1930s and 1940s before we got involved in the second world war and how it still prevails even after the war no one tell her about operation paperclip or either that how again our military industrial complex and corporate media help contribute to forever wars across the world. So let's first pull up this video where Rachel Maddow in, I believe, New York City of all places, is talking about her book until Jose Vega and a colleague of due dissidents, Russell, decide to step up and uh, enlighten the audience about just how pathetic this whole charade truly is. Let's play it. Rachel, I'd rather not listen to your boring book because you are here to get Israel wrong yet again. Just like you got 2016 wrong yet again. All you are is the biggest war monger. You and the rest of the media are the biggest war mongers ever. Why is it that other countries are calling for peace? Brazil, Russia, India, and China all call for peace. I'm the United Nations. And what do you do? You're just a big, ugly thing. You're a war monger. All of you are just straight war mongers. That's right. Look at what they do to free speech. There's an ethnic cleansing in Gaza. And all you do is tell lies about it. You and the rest of the media are war mongers. Every single one of you are all war mongers. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Go home. See us now. Who works in this I know. I had a feeling we were talking about somebody was not happy with something. He was one of the most successful and celebrated industrialists on the Beyonce. Rachel, would you consider Benjamin Netanyahu an authoritarian foreign leader? Sit down. Can you please answer that? We're not here to Would talk you to consider you. Netanyahu a dangerous authoritarian foreign leader? Will you answer that? Will you stand up for the Muslim anchors at MSNBC who have been taken off the air? Will you speak for them? Will you speak up for them? What what do you call a country that bombs people in a hospital? Is that fascism? 
Do you only see fascism when it's wearing a red hat? So, Jose Vega, welcome. Had to play those two videos for everyone to understand uh, what exactly was going on. So, first of all, huge shout out to you and do dissidents for being on the ground and actually calling out these corporate media jagoffs for the hypocrites that they truly are. But uh, I got to ask, first of all, number one, was your track record? How did you guys find out about this? I don't give too much away because I hope to see a sequel to this sometime in the future. But number two, um, what was the overall environment of the area? Because I'm seeing all these quote unquote people listening to Rachel Maddow and all I'm getting is flashbacks from 2016 where people saying they were part of the resistance. But now that the orange boogeyman's out of office and see now old man Biden is in office, um, you know, everyone's at brunch getting fat. But yet now they're still triggered that Trump's still in the race. So let's start from the beginning. How the hell did this happened and the overall environment of the room before you and Russell uh, spoke out? Um, well, quote unquote, people is right, because sometimes I don't believe that these people are real. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the uh, the way we found out, well, we just found out straight. You know, it was just announced and Russ got us tickets. That's it. That's that's how we got in. So, you know, Beautiful. Uh, that that's that's all there is to that story. Um, the overall environment before was like it was horrible. It was like, I'm so glad there are people here who like Rachel Maddow just as much as I do. Oh, my God. Oh this God. temple is so full now. Oh, man. It's so great. It's so great. And then I heard there was a woman in front of me talking about how Amy Goodman lost her touch, you know, um, oh, Amy yeah? Goodman of, of democracy now. And it's so funny because like. You know, I, I let me not get in on Amy Goodman. Let me stick to the event. But yeah. um, Rachel Maddow, uh, you know, all of these people were just like her adoring, diehard fans who came out to see her. And it, this was happening at a Jewish synagogue, uh, Temple Emmanuel, which is one of the largest and most historical synagogues in all of New York City. So before Rachel came out, somebody came, uh, it was the rabbi or a Jewish rabbi came out and said, you know, our hearts are with Israel today. You know, as we think about all these poor Israeli people who are dying by the senseless violence done, perpetrated by, you know, uh, the terrorists Hamas. And so let's just give our prayer for peace. And then, um, then they brought out Rachel and Rachel came out. She said, my heart today is in that region. And then she started reading her book. Now, one thing is, is that when we walked in, they gave us a book, right? Because the thing about buying a ticket is if you buy a ticket, you get a book. Whoa. And, uh, Are you, was the book for free or was that just like the ticket? Like how much was a ticket? Just just, just out of clarity. Do you, do, you, do you know what the price was? I don't even want to say. No, it was it was like uh, 50 bucks, I think. Holy so. shit. Just I didn't pay that. Them. Okay, great, great. Well, what Russell did. All right, so I have to give Russell some shite for that. All right, <laughs> give him, give him some shit for that. Yeah, but, uh, but uh, no, uh, yeah. So you get a that's hey, you get a free book. But I was reading the book. It was the most boring thing ever because the first three pages are about why um, uh, uh, Dracula sucks or something, and why it's gay erotica. And I was wondering why anyone would even read this shit. No, and get then, out of here. No, it's not. You're lying. Are you serious? That's what it is. That's what it is. Yeah. She the, the first sentence was something like, you know, um, this the the vampire story came out in 917 with a kiss of Bram uh, with a kiss of uh, Dracula and a scent of Oscar Wilde. And that's right. The uh, the author was a very big fan of Oscar Wilde and Jesus Christ. And as much as the author may not like to admit it, this was gay erotica for its time. And it was not a good book. And then she just goes on and on like that for like the next two, three pages. And so I'm I'm reading this and I'm like, what the fuck? This what? is so boring. This is so boring. And so <laughs> in thinking about how to open, I thought about Max Blumenthal because Max Blumenthal had confronted her before too. And right. he said, hey, Rachel, this is boring. And I was like, well, this book is boring. And what was about to happen was as she started, uh, she was going to read a portion from her book and then go sit down with Ben Stiller and talk about it. But when Russ and I were texting, I was like, I really don't want to sit around here and listen to her read this boring book. I'm just going to go in the beginning. So uh, then, so yeah, so then it, it happened. And uh, I stood up as you saw there, and then I was wheelbarrowed out of there. Uh, you know, you see from the video, the guy just pulled me straight from my jacket collar, which was just yeah. like, 
you know, Jesus Christ. I mean, I mean I've, I've never been manhandled that hard before. <laughs> I, I've been manhandled, but that was like, you know, and uh, when we got to the back of the church and the filming stopped, like, the guy just grabbed me by the scruff of the jacket. And then he, like, did a thing where he moved his hand up to slap the back of my head. Uh, and he did. But it was kind oh. of like one of these things where you could be, you know, I think he was an ex-cop or something just because of what Russ was saying. And also the way that this guy was just he knew the way to kind of handle a person to get your hands on somebody without leaving a mark or leaving some kind of plausible deniability. But when I got outside, um, the guy was like, have NYPD question him interview him and i was like yeah just let me get my stuff and i'll be on my way because when you go in you had to mm -hmm. check in your bag and uh i um so i i the, but the guy was adam was like no you're not getting your stuff buddy you're gonna spend the night in jail tonight and that was what the security guard told me then well that's the other thing people should should realize this is the mm -hmm. largest synagogue in new york city there were nypd counterterrorism cops outside i mean like dudes with rifles ready to just do whatever they needed to make sure that this place doesn't, you know, end up like, a, like they're, they're doing their job. So the security guard came out, was really upset, told NYPD all sorts of things. And so then the cop looks at me and says, what happened tonight, buddy? I said, all I did was I decided to heckle and use my free speech and my first amendment. So I just want my stuff and I'm not going to be in anyone's way. And the cop's like, well, listen, it's a private event, man. You, you can't just, and I was like, well, the, uh, my first amendment doesn't end at a private event so listen just give me my stuff i'm gonna go i've done this thousands of times and the cop was like all right fine no problem Good. so then the uh the security guard though was just like adamant it's like well i want his name and i want his id and i was like no no no, no. the cop's not gonna do any of that okay you're just gonna give me my bag and i'm gonna go and so then the security guard finally came out with like a butt buddy of his and okay. his butt buddy started taking a picture of me and the mm -hmm. security guard says, well, you know, uh, oh, you, you dropped something from your bag. Yeah, you might want to look. And I was like, no, I didn't. You just want your friend to take a picture of me. If you just wanted a selfie, you could just ask. It's okay. <laughs> so, but then, then I waited like 10, 15 minutes, and then Russ went. Mm -hmm. And then Russ, you know, he did his thing, as you saw. Right. And this time, the security guard was with a vengeance. The security guard came out telling the cops, it is the wish of the temple that this man be arrested for trespassing. And Russ is like, I bought a ticket. I'm not trespassing. And then and then the security guard says, hey, is so-and-so working right now? Let me talk to so-and-so. And Russ like started freaking out because that meant if they knew somebody personally, you know, cops can be hard asses. If, if they want you to spend the right. night or two in jail, they'll make sure you do that. Mm, so, so much for the First Amendment, I guess, huh? So Russ said, all right, well, listen, if you don't give me my stuff back, I'll let him tell this. But if you don't give me my stuff back, I'm just going to start interviewing people as they come out. So immediately the security gave him <laughs> his stuff back and then he was on his merry way. But that's that's what happened. Yeah. Mm. So uh, let me guess. So it was uh, one big circle jerk where Rachel Maddow was talking about her oh so fantastic book. Ben Stiller was there being the atypical Hollywood elite. Um, but I, I, you know, here's, here's a couple things that, that, that really stood out to me. And that is, look, the whole thing was Russia gate and how Rachel Maddow made that her bread and butter during the, yeah. um, two years of the Trump administration. And obviously afterwards, you know, the, it's been debunked, you know, and numerous media outlets have talked about how, oh, it wasn't Russia that caused Hillary the election. It was Hill dog herself. That's right. She was a piss poor candidate, but no one tell Bernie Sanders what happened, especially how the DNC committed election fraud and denied him the nomination in the 2016 primary. But that's a different subject altogether. Just had to throw it out there because Bernie's the biggest cuck in American politics and Hillary <laughs> was the worst politician in 2016 to lose to Donald Trump because she did lose to Donald Trump and she was supposed to be the oh so fantastic one propped up by corporate media such as MSNBC and CNN. But we're seeing that entire audience and we're seeing people promote and cheer a corporate stenographer, a corporate puppet who's just not telling the news, but reading a script, reading a script and misleading people. And it's, it's, it's surprising how easily uh, we could be turned into sheeps and then get get once again uh, fall into the propaganda and fear that, oh, my goodness gracious, Cretaceous, there's fascism here in America when 
it's 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 kind of been here for quite some time. No one tell anybody about Operation Paperclip or how we got to the moon. But that entire audience, uh, even even when it's their turn to really ever step up, they they won't even do what you did. They're just more of silent, obedient crew. So, um, what 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 can we overall take away from this? Because if this is a sign of how. 2024 will play out, especially during the presidential election cycle. I, I'm beginning to fear that people are probably more brainwashed or easy that more subservient than I thought. And yet again, we haven't even hit rock bottom. I want to get your thoughts. Well, I think people don't have to worry because that audience was all gray haired, uh, you know, liberals from that area. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of happy about that because I was like, okay, thank God there aren't that many young people here. Um, and I think that just, and, and this is a two-edged sword because young people are pessimistic about the world right now and they don't right. really know what to believe in. So on one hand, that's a good thing because they are not going to trust the mainstream media, but it's a bad thing overall because they're not going to trust anyone or anything and they're not going to be able to contribute uh, productively or optimistically to you know, making sure that the country can actually function safely and you know, there, there's freedom for people. So it's a double-edged sword and I think that the takeaway here is that uh, the mainstream media and people who are like Rachel Maddow diehard fans is is dying out. And it's going to die out with that generation. I mean, they're, they're just getting old, you know. These are just boomers who can't fathom and realize that their time is up. You know, mm-hmm. that there's a new generation of alternative media coming out there. And there's also a new generation of people who aren't just going to take it lying down anymore. I think... Um, I think I think right now it's up for platforms like yourselves and other platforms that do indie media to really strike while the iron is hot. Get people while they're pessimistic and give them a reason to be optimistic that, hey, there is a source of truth and information and free speech out there that does not have to start at the cable box. It can start on Rumble, you know, or Rofkin or whatever other platforms people are using nowadays. I don't mention YouTube because they, they, they're, they're just the worst when it comes to free speech, but... You know, I, I, I would just I would just say to the audience, like, don't worry, the, the mainstream media is dying. And the only people who cheer her on are just washed up old liberals who are has Like I was in that audience. I was listening to like grandmas talk about, oh, I wrote this book that had so and so famous person blurb on it. So I'm still relevant. It's OK. It's like, no, oh, you're no. dying soon. I did not. Well, you're no one is going to read these books. Nobody's going to keep watching Rachel Maddow, and that's okay. Well, it's it, it is interesting that we are seeing, especially with corporate media. Look, um, I I covered recently on the show on how not one but three Muslim anchors were sidelined yeah. on MSNBC, which is Rachel Maddow's uh, network that she's a part of. And uh, the, the of course, MSNBC was quick to say it, it isn't because uh, they said anything about Gaza or anything positive. It's uh, we're, we're doing a shakeup. Ratings are plummeting down just a little bit. It's it's the same corporate talk. And then we hear about how six people who were with the BBC then get uh, kicked out or are or, or being threatened to be fired. Then you have an uh, uh, um, a cartoonist for The Guardian um being fired and uh look um it's a little bit off talk but uh gigi hadid who is a uh, or hadid uh who is gigi hadid apologies if i got the name wrong who's a model whose father is palestinian the israel uh, uh the israeli government uh accused this american model uh you know just saying hey we got an eye on you and then there's um mia khalifa who uh was more or less kicked off of uh you know uh playboy and then you know and uh she's she's being uh, uh vilified as this uh evil person and yet there seems to be this massive onslaught that if you say anything anything positive or bring awareness to the crisis in gaza and how people are being exterminated and blown up um you are blacklisted and i i find it interesting that not only private citizens are being attacked like this but even corporate media because corporate media has a long sad horrific history of vilifying anyone that steps outside the narrative it's it, it is it is a very big revealing moment that i think is flying over a lot of people's heads in regards to just how powerful the establishment will be and what it will do even if you work with the establishment how fast it will be 
to uh, how fast it'll do to put the jackboot of censorship on your neck. And to be clear here, I wanted to make me a cliff and uh, obviously uh, Gigi Hadid is, are there. They're not with corporate media, but these are just two examples of just private yeah. citizens just giving their criticism to the or these that not, not Gigi Hadid, but her father being Palestinian, but Israeli government going after. And then there's Mia Khalifa, who was critical of Gaza, how the Israeli government or is that pro Israeli groups of the apartheid government are going after private citizens. I want to get your thoughts on that. No, I, you also see some like, uh, I don't like people go to Harvard, but there are Harvard law students who are losing mm -hmm. their um, offers from top law firms because of their commitment to making sure that uh, there's um, an upholding of human rights in Gaza. So just that, right? So some of these, there was a, a letter published by Harvard students, I think, it, and uh, uh, three of those people so far all had offers from top law firms, and then those offers were publicly rescinded so that those law firms can say, no, we stand with Israel. We would never bring on anyone who, who would ever dare to question that authority. So, you know, you're, you're, you're completely right um, that uh, there is a blacklisting going on, but I think what's different about this time is that the mood around the world is so hot that that's not going to mean anything, honestly, within the next two months. And I think, especially after this Israeli hospital strike, I mean, you know, yeah. just nobody can, which, by the way, Biden just, like, lied about. He said, well, based off what i seen, I think apparently it was the other team. You know, I actually careful. have the I actually have the video in question right here where. Uh, Biden decides to uh, uh, play it up, and he what, what he says more or less is uh, he compares it to a football team, and it was the other team, the other team that did it. And here we actually have an article from The Hill, so let me go ahead and use that as a citation here just so that people can see it firsthand, and you can see it uh, for yourself as well. But uh, it is <clears throat> Ben uh, Biden tells Netanyahu Gaza hospital hit appears to be by the other yeah. team, not you. Uh, and uh, the point is, is that I was deeply saddened and outraged by the explosion of the hospital in Gaza yesterday. And based on what I've seen, it appears as though it was done by the other team, not you. But there's a lot of people out there. Not sure. So we've got. A lot. We've got a lot to overcome, <laughs> a lot of things. So that's what he says. So, uh, I mean, I don't know if his team is, is failing him or Biden uh, is getting the memo, but that is not a statement of confidence yeah, right, right there uh, because uh, there's evidence out there showing that uh, it was an airstrike. Now, last I checked, I don't think Gaza or Hamas has an air force, um, but I, I know you've been reading up on it. I didn't mean to cut you off, but can you uh, uh, continue on with what you were saying? No, I was just, uh, thank you for bringing that up, but I was just saying that you cannot continue to have an Israeli flag and say, I stand with Israel, and then support that, because that's what that is. If you have an Israeli flag in your bio, and and then that happens and you know about that and you keep it there that is a that is you saying yeah i'm still that's okay with me that is still an implicit support of what that just happened so i think those people who got their offers rescinded will have better opportunities because the world is going to realize that israel here was the is the oppressor was mm -hmm. the oppressor is committing a genocide and is committing Ethnic. Are we on YouTube? I'm sorry. I'm like throwing out words, and I don't want to. Oh, uh, that's fine. That's fine. We're we're actually uh, we're, we're, obviously this will be on YouTube, of course, but it'll also be on Rumble and Rockfin as well. So you know, it's it's yeah. all good. But I mean, let's let's be clear here. Um, there is, um, there there. This is more or less a war crime. Let's be very clear. A hospital getting struck, and of course, corporate media is in its quandary where you see CNN, MSNBC doing cartwheels and mental gymnastics in regards to how to actually cover it. Because, look, this is the day and age of the Internet, folks. Uh, Jose, you know this better than anyone else here. You can't you can't hide anything forever. Eventually, people are going to be asking questions. This isn't the 1990s. This isn't the early 2000s. Now, now we have these smartphones. We have the Library of Alexandria at our fingertips. And, of course, we're going to be seeing things and people are going to be questioning things. And a lot of people have these things called smartphones. And everyone's uh, – as 
You can't tell me. You can't tell me with all the stuff that's happening there that people aren't recording from various different angles and various perspectives that the media can't get to. Because traditionally, you know, when we when when the media was on the ground there, we only got CNN or MSNBC's or Fox News perspective. You know, now th there is there there should be a call and need for citizen journalists. I mean, this is the end. I think, or should be the beginning of the end of people like Rachel Maddow, who for a long time got under soapbox and, well, was the perfect puppet for the establishment. But I want to get, I, but I know you were going to say a few other things here, so I want to get give the floor to you. No, 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 it's okay. I, uh, I, I would just say that um, Israel's losing the narrative war now. I think the Palestinians have had twenty years of social media in, influence and. Uh, I've known people who had Palestinian flags who are just normies, you know, forever. I have people now who never even wanted to touch Ukraine, Russia, who just wanted to go about their lives, now come out in full mobilization to support Palestine, um, which is, you know, it's, it's a good thing. I mean, I'm upset that it takes people dying in order to get to that point. But, you know, at least they're up and, and, and awake now. And I think it just goes to show that Israel's is actually going to be the last nail in the coffin for all the imperialism. People already see what this is, especially with the fact that uh, the Biden administration is now going to ask Congress to pass a hundred billion dollars for Israel and Ukraine. I mean, <laughs> billions of dollars for war, but the people of Maui get seven hundred dollars one time, seven hundred dollars, and yeah, they're right, being displaced right. from the homes. And I did, I did make this joke on my show earlier. Uh, it was yesterday when I made this joke, but uh, you know, Biden flying out to Israel. Uh, according to my invisible watch, he has yet to visit East Palestine, Ohio, and for some reason, my cynical mind is playing this dark joke in my head. Now, this will probably not play out. And I'm probably I, I'm, I'm I, I hope I, I don't see it. But if I do, I, I will laugh uncontrollably. But if someone asks Biden, hey, are you going to visit East Palestine, Ohio? He's going to confuse East Palestine, Ohio for Palestine. And he's going to be like, yeah, I was there. There were no trained derailments, Jack. <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> yeah. Oh, man. No, well, I mean, I, again, again, we, we, we have a senile old man running this country, of course. But n n nonetheless, though. It, it is apparent that we do have to challenge the system. And before you do head out, um, look, we do need to have more citizen journalists calling out these corporate jagoffs for who they are. We actually got a video here of Max Blumenthal of of him actually confronting Rachel Maddow. And this was done sometime on June 2nd of 2023. Yeah. So, you know, hey, it's a special treat for all of you because why not? But, you know, again, if these corporate pundits are also smart, you think they would be able to take the criticism and be confident in a room that's filled with most of their followers, but uh, they can't. They always get shook up. Bent on overthrowing the U.S. government, and members of Congress who are sympathetic. Rachel, this speech is boring and paranoid. Can you explain why you promoted the steel? Why did you promote the steel? <laughs> it's been proven to be a lie. <laughs> Russian bounties. Can you ever be held accountable for the lies you told Let's Americans for years and Let's years go. and years? <laughs> I love that shame on you, and you are not welcome here. Lie to Americans for Let's years. Go. Let's go. Silence is You're violence, out. Rachel. You're out. You're out. <laughs> God, Maddow's face is the big brother. Which one? Rachel Maddow refusing to answer questions about the lying about the steel dossier, lying about yeah, Russian bounties, out. and doing a paranoid speech claiming Nazism is afoot in America. And I'm being thrown out by security now. There was no Q&A. If there was Q&A, I would have politely asked a question. They, oh, yeah, there was. Yeah, exactly. There was no there was a Q&A at our thing, but it was no cards and they were collecting them. Oh, our... no, for real. They were doing that like, oh, they're probably the most softball questions ever. Well, Ben Stiller God. has to read them, so you know he and his what is his literacy rate at like a high school level? So, <sighs> hey man, yeah. look, he's he's building a school for 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 kids, man. But make sure that we, when you build the model, you can't have a school for the size with kids the size of ants, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, before before I go, Russ and I had jokes ready in case Ben Stiller wanted to get nasty back at us too. Oh like, yeah, uh, yeah. I was oh, like, I gotta hear yeah. one. 
I, I, was, I was ready to tell Ben, like, hey, Ben, don't get into this because I'm ready to forgive this as the next Zoolander filming, okay? So <laughs> watch out. Uh, uh, I think uh, Russ, Russ was going to say, like, uh, listen, Ben, you haven't been relevant since Zoolander 2, all right? So, you oh, know. No. <laughs> damn, damn. <laughs> you know what? You know what? I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna have to ask Russ what his jokes were because I'm gonna yeah, have to yeah, get him yeah, on the yeah. show. It's 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 long overdue that I have to get uh, Russ from Due Dissonance on the show. But seriously, great job to both of you. But uh, I think as a final question, uh, where what what do you want to tell people who are sitting in the sidelines who do want to get involved? Because let's face it, 2024 it won't be the most important election year of our lifetime, but I think it will be the most exciting. There's a difference between yeah. most important and exciting. And I think it'll be exciting. I want to hold out for hope that it'll be exciting. But what I want to say to people who are maybe sitting in the sidelines choosing not to get involved or either that maybe want to get involved but uh, are a little bit afraid. What do, you, what do you want to say to them? Well, look, um, there are various degrees to get in, and I believe that all motion creates something. Mm -hmm. And I think something as small as calling a congressman, it, it creates a ripple effect. It all Because it all works in conjunction all together. There is a moment right now in world history mm -hmm. that you need to get into. So if you could only do something small like calling a congressman, fine. It helps. But there are various degrees than going outside with a sign and just holding up a sign that says, you know, Israel's committing ethnic genocide, you know, or ethnic cleansing in Gaza. Do that. If you can then go to your congressman's office with that sign, do that. If you can go to D.C., as I did recently, I walked around the Capitol and I was going around the offices telling them, listen, you know, we don't want there to be a war with Ukraine or Russia. We don't want World War Three. We don't want funding for Israel. Do that. Mm -hmm. And if you can intervene, do that too. Try to aim for the most you can do because that is the most good you can do. So that's my advice to right you. On. Don't sit on the sideline because you don't need to let the waves crash on you of history. You mm -hmm. control the waves. But make Done them happen. Deal. Yeah. Done deal. That is a fantastic note to end it on. Jose, I want to thank you so much for joining us. I know you have to head out, so I'm going to uh, push you out. And no pun intended. Just make sure, man, you just keep on uh, use the power, out, man. man. Uh, but, you know, hey, hey, we're, we're politely opening the door. We're not grabbing you by the <laughs> neck and throwing you out. So, again, thank you so much for joining us. Please follow Jose Vega on his social media as well. He's uh, what's what's where, where can people follow you on Twitter real quick? At Hose B Trigger, J O S B T R I G G A on Twitter slash X. So, Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic note to end it on. So, thank you so much for everyone that's watching. Uh, please uh, keep on supporting Hard Lens Media. You could find out more about us on our YouTube, Rockfin Rumble account pages. And as we end this show, we're going to be playing a, a song from Jesse Jet. So, as always, folks, thank you so much. Peace to you guys. And now more than ever, let us all do what we can to build a better future and hopefully one day maybe peace in our time someday peace in Idolatry, that's just fake. And all that wallowing, that you tolerate, that's not faith. The kings of colony, what starts on me, make our graves. The kings of colony, no, no policy, only rave. Now, once you fall asleep, won't bother you what they say But the kings of colony While they slaughter They still complain And we say Please color me Still too solemnly Still too plain All hail economy Praise the pharmacy Season flames They're buying up Hawaii 
and the smoke's not even cleared. Those vultures smelled the fire and an enterprise appeared. Investment opportunities were melted down communities leave vacant space. BlackRock has been lusting for for years. The council meets in private and they don't discuss survivors. Concerns among construction groups are all the hyena hears. They'll wander through your city with this mocking sword of pity next to Oprah and her camera crew who tore the trail of tears. Where footage flows as freely as the stream of liquid steel and the pools of pure aluminum that trickled down your wheels. And Biden's here to say he knows exactly how it feels because he had a kitchen fire once and had to miss a meal. And people still believe that piece of shit deserves your vote. Like he's not why supplies are being smuggled in by boat. Like he's not why our citizens were forced to stay and roast. And he can't unfreeze your funding, folks, because Azov needs it most. I'll bet my every dollar Biden watched it with a smile. I'll bet he knows the whereabouts of every missing child. He's just the kind of man who lives to trample something tribal, collecting culture's corpses just to throw them on the pile. Like he and all his buddies didn't dream about the day when those who dared defy the donor class were cleared away. When home insurance triples and you can't afford to stay and your land falls to the hands of those whose windfall fanned the flames, the state will take Lahaina and they'll bastardize its name and tourism will swarm it all the same. You see the state we left Lahaina shows the ground rules of the game, the planes that in the night ignite the planes. And if questions raised that reckon the potential use of lasers, I suggest you take a closer shave by way of Occam's razor. And if those civilians stood between this country and its gains, then there's really nothing further to explain. Because you may know this already, if you truly know our past, but it ain't the first occasion and it will not be the last where Americans are kettled in and made to bear the blast, are barricaded in and left for ash. How many in Lahaina now are lying there awake and still can hear the city we left leveled in our wake? They still hear all the people that we let the fire take, instructed from above to stay in place. So look to the horizon, because a fire comes for you. Desire made incarnate of the power-hungry few who instructed the police to not let anybody through, to barricade them in, and so they do.